Please are in listen only mode. Hello, my name is Erin Elliott and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement for the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Thank you for tuning in to this faculty mini college recording session highlighting U of M faculty from different schools and colleges talking about their research. Each year, the university holds two mini college events in Naples, Florida and Phoenix, Arizona. Mini college is a half day lifelong learning opportunity that features presentations from faculty around the U. Mini college is a partnership from, with the university of schools and colleges, units, alumni association and the U of M foundation. Wendy Pratt Luger will be presenting at the Arizona mini college this year. It is my pleasure to welcome Wendy Pratt Luger to present on the topic, A Look at the University Libraries Today, The Digital World of Bytes and Books. Wendy is a university librarian and McKnight Presidential Professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. The university library system encompasses 12 libraries on the Twin Cities campus, historically rich in collections and award-winning programs in technology development, content services, and new models and support for research and learning. Prior to her appointment at the University of Minnesota in 2002, Luge had held several positions at the University of Michigan for over a 20 year period. Her work in launching and developing a premier digital library program at Michigan was recognized by the American Library Association's Hugh Atkinson Award. Luge's service portfolio includes the board of directors for the Association of Research Libraries, the Research Libraries Group, and the Council on Library and Information Resources the Digital Library Federation, and the National Information Standards Organization. Her research and publications have focused on digital library development, information economics, assessment of research behavior, and virtual organizations. Luger holds a BA in English from Lawrence University, an MS in Library Science from the University of Wisconsin, and an MA in Psychology from the University of Minnesota. Thank you for being here today, Wendy. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and uh, share the stage with uh, so many distinguished faculty uh, colleagues. One thing that you'll see as you uh, talk to faculty that are here or listen to their presentations is that at the heart of what each of the presenters uh, will be sharing is, is a process of creating and sharing knowledge, whether it's discoveries in the research agenda, whether it's in the classroom and helping students understand uh, the discovery process and the milestones within different disciplines of the evolution of knowledge. And knowledge is really all about sharing uh, and that evolution of taking information to a next level, to contextualizing it and to um, discovering new things, sharing insights. And the common thread uh, through all of that is, is really what a library is all about. It's about those knowledge assets. It's about uh, stewarding them over time. It's about tracking the evolution of disciplines and really supporting the teaching and learning and research of, of higher education and of our institution. So what I want to do today is to give you that context of how the library is an integral role player in the, um, and partner in what goes on at the University of Minnesota. But to do that, I'm really going to have to uh, take on and to challenge, if you will, what you and I might have experienced when we were in college, what those classic roles of the library were and how they've changed. So to start with, let's, let's look at uh, an icon here of what represents the library, I think, in its, in its classic role. So you see here, for example, uh, the fact that uh, there's an author and title there. Libraries collect things. They uh, select from the best within a discipline and try to track what has happened over time. And they don't bring in just everything. It's, it's, a, it's a highly selective uh, uh, process of, of building collections. And then you look at the uh, call number here, and that represents what we do to provide access to knowledge resources, to content. Um, yeah, good old Dewey Decimal System here, but there are many other systems. And what that does is help contextualize information. If you 
look at the books on the shelf. They're arranged in a framework of knowledge that helps you uh, know how a given item fits within others. It helps you browse and, and see things that are similar. And the last bit of information here, and uh, you probably can't make out the name, but I think it's Bobby Loving, um, individual users. Now, those, each of those users had a reason to come to the library and take out this book, had a, uh, an inquiry need, perhaps it was for a course, perhaps it was for a part of research, uh, scholarship, but each of these names represents a particular need for information and a way that the library could uh, help fulfill that, that need. Now, uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, these cards are a thing of the past because Back in the day, when they were simply inserted in the back of books, of course, they revealed a lot of information that really was intended to be kept private. So these days, we have ways of protecting uh, users' confidentiality and in, in making use of information. But let's take this icon and think about um, how it really represents what libraries do. At heart, they collect information, they make it accessible, and then there are services that help meet those needs of individual users. And what I want to do today is to explore how those classic roles have changed in a digital era. Now, I, I could talk uh, for more than an hour just uh, about the forces of change alone, but let me just encapsulate them here in these, in these four pictures. We all know technology has wrought a whole range of changes. Uh, once we began to have uh, computing technology and the internet and the World Wide Web, anyone could serve as a publisher of sorts, sharing information freely online. Anyone could function as a library, that is to say, to gather information that had some relevance uh, and relationship and putting it together on a website. So you saw a fundamental change in the kind of access to playing those roles and also the ease with which we can share things. And no big surprise, that changed publishing tremendously. Certainly we've seen every major publisher uh, move towards digital production. They may also still produce print, but the, the creation of publication is now almost wholly digital and delivered to multiple types of devices. Now the other part of this equation is what has changed within the academy, within the classroom, within the research lab. You see at the lower left here an active learning classroom. Now the way that a class like this might take place is that the lecture is delivered online uh, that a student can watch at any point in time, any place, but the actual class experience is in this round table uh, situation where students get together to solve a problem, to work on a particular type of experiential learning, uh, often with a good deal of technology. And then on the lower right, you see a sort of uh, symbol of how some of research is changing. Almost all disciplines are now rely heavily on digital data. And when I say data, I don't just mean scientific data. It could be art images in digital form. It could be uh, linguistic text. It could be a whole range of, of things that are now accessible digitally. And with the rise of the digital content has come a whole range of tools for analysis. You see here some visualization and mapping tools. There are others that allow uh, text mining or help to uh, analyze different trends or patterns within digital assets. So a, a lot has happened to really empower students and faculty and all of us to use information in very different ways. So these forces all together have, have been significant in shaping what goes on at the university but also uh, what goes on in the libraries. Now. I tried to capture some of these changes back in the year 2002 when uh, I came to the University of Minnesota. Um, this was a, a white paper that was authored for the Council on Library and Information Resources, a sort of international think tank. And what, I've, what I have on the screen here is a phrase that I think captures some of the trends that I just talked about, that we have very distributed technologies where anyone in the world can access uh, certain types of information can share information in a very open way, freely sharing in content. 
and we've also seen a shift where people are sharing information that might be earlier in the what you might call scholarship cycle before something is published sharing the raw materials perhaps or they might share content within their course so it allows the library to potentially be involved at all stages and in all contexts of knowledge creation dissemination and use so our old construct of library where it was defined by those collections that you physically could experience and the services that supported the, co the collection uh, have really changed and the library becomes as I've noted here a real really diffuse agent uh, within the scholarly community now one other way of looking at that and, and here is a um, uh, capture that, uh, that a colleague of mine has put together but I find really compelling in terms of what kinds of paradigms are we seeing so in the past content was scarce but our attention was abundant we could be much more focused but now we have the opposite where our attention is increasingly scarce and the resources on the internet are abundant so how do we help individuals deal with that shift and when it comes to the work that we all do the the workflow it used to be that we expected our workflows to be built around the library and its services we had to know when the library was open and we had to get there and hope that the book was on the shelf so it really was limiting in what we could do but now the paradigm is more that we in the library community need to build programs around individual workflow <clears throat> excuse me and figure out what it is that those workflows are and how we can virtually support them so a lot of what I want to share with you today is about this fundamental shift where libraries have become far more diffuse and in the flow of what uh, users are, are doing whether it's a student a faculty member or the general public that's using our libraries and as you can see in these images it's everywhere from the clinical setting to the research setting to the coffee shop where a student might be at two in the morning and using the library perhaps on his or her cell phone so let's let's start by looking at those classic roles and let's let me try to highlight for you some of the dimensions of change that are happening so first of all we still are a physical library 12 libraries strong we're big and bulky at 8.2 million volumes and uh, I think we've most recently ranked about 16th or 17th in North America in terms of size physically um, but so much more has changed over 90,000 electronic journals that uh, feel like a journal operate like a journal uh, ebooks uh, streaming music images uh, data simulations we buy all of those things now in fact close to 80% of the expenditures that we have for the collection are now digital um, here you see an art image a photography um, collection of Ansel Adams works but what has changed well with the digital uh, there can be multiple users at any one given time it's not restricted to who physically can check out a volume it can be 7 by 24 access the text could be fully searchable so you can find that word that you're looking for or that theme on the page and that would never have been possible in the analog world it could be interactive it could be multimedia and here's a very simple example a chemical engineering handbook uh, that we uh, have in the physical collection certainly but we also since 2011 have had it in digital form and it's been used over 90,000 times that simply could not happen in the physical world we couldn't check it out fast enough and that the library couldn't be open the number of hours to check it out so a lot has changed on that dimension but in addition we're seeing the rise of wholly new genre that we uh, could perhaps never have anticipated and here's but a few examples at the top left uh, living reviews is a journal series uh, uh, from the Max Planck Institute and it is a, a construct where the author continues to edit and revise and add to their article over time in fact over their lifetime so that notion that a journal article is fixed uh, has been debunked 
it really becomes organic and, and living over time. In the lower left, you see uh, a work uh, by Ed Ayers, uh, one of the very first humanistic publications that challenged the physical world. It is a book, The Presence of Mind Enemies, but it is also a database that uh, accompanies the book online where one can explore three communities in the Civil War and interact with the data and see how things transpired chronologically, the, the spatial relationship of those communities. The third example from the uh, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, is a journal, Science Signaling. Uh, that it's a journal that deals with how cells communicate with one another. So the journal is fairly traditional. But in addition, there are tools that allow readers, uh, researchers, to collaborate with one another to map that communication of cells. So you see here one of the little online maps that are created as part of the journal. A very different sense of what, what constitutes publication. In this case, many people contributing to uh, the publication itself. Now, we, we spend somewhere upwards of $18 million a year on content for the campus, uh, physical things, digital things. But we've also seen a shift in how we think about how to use those dollars instrumentally uh, to support the priorities of the institution. And as we all know, there are issues about student affordability these days. And in addition to tuition, one of the big hits that a student takes is the cost of course materials. Average student spends $1,200 a year on textbook and other course materials. And unfortunately, too often, 65% of students have decided at one point or another not to buy a text due to cost. So the libraries have begun using uh, some portion of our collection dollars to, to address that. We've been working with faculty to redesign courses where they might elect to use an open textbook or some freely available content, or perhaps to create new content or new textbooks that are freely available. We've worked with them also to license content when we can so that all the students can freely access it and the library pays for it. And we've also worked to create digital course packs where a variety of things they want to support the course are brought together and delivered to the student digitally. This last fall alone, uh, addressing just a very modest number of courses in this way, we've saved students over $700,000. A really exciting uh, trend, I think, that we can, we can make a difference in making courses uh, more affordable. Now, our collections are beyond the sort of books on the shelf, uh, but Minnesota is really known for extraordinary archives and special collections. And here you see a um, list of some of our archival collections, uh, but also some images from some of them. Uh, here are some of the history of computing and information technology in the Babbage archives. Uh, here is an image from our Performing Arts Archives. Uh, this is a Julius Caesar production in 1969 at the Guthrie. Here you see something from our Children's Research Literature Collections. Uh, this is an art uh, illustration from Betsy Bowen, a Minnesota uh, illustrator. And lastly, a very small piece from the archives of Robert Bly from our literary archives. All of these are extraordinary, one-of-a-kind resources that, that we have an opportunity to share with the world um, through the digital lens. And let me give you an example here that is really one that is, I think, quite exciting. Recently, we had a grant uh, from the state's legacy program to digitize the history of the university and of the state, really, in terms of the flora and fauna of the state. This is capturing the history of, of natural resources and in particular the programs at the university that really were the, the founding infrastructure, if you will, of documenting the natural history of the state. So this is largely materials uh, from the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And as we were digitizing all of those resources from those departments on campus and early programs, we found that the university had a seaside station in British Columbia. And it turns out that one of the researchers there 
uh, woman named Josephine Tilden was the first female faculty member researcher uh, at the university affiliated with a program that now would be part of the College of Biological Sciences. And one of her colleagues that was at the seaside station had a camera and took photographs of the area, but also of a, a First Nations tribe that was on a nearby island. And you see one of the photographs here. Now the curator of this archive, um, as she was having all of the collection digitized, began to blog about it and capture some of the processes and some of the findings. And she blogged about this, this finding of these wonderful photographs, early lantern photographs, actually. And it turned out the folks in British Columbia found out about this on the internet and, and relayed to us that these are the first known photographs of the First Nations people here, the Pontchart tribe. So who would have ever predicted that within an archive about the university's work dealing with Minnesota flora and fauna, natural resources, we would find this treasure of early photographs of this First Nations people. So the power of digital, uh, not only in, in saving these treasures, because they are very brittle in formats that are no longer in existence, like lantern slides, but sharing them. And lastly here, I want to give you an example about how content can come together, print and digital. We have here uh, Professor Michael Hancher in English. And this term, he's teaching a course in Victorian literatures and cultures. And he has the students look at the media, if you will, of the day, the news media, to look at Punch Magazine, to look at London Times, to look at them in their original print form, which sadly is very brittle now because the paper is, is uh, deteriorating. But it also turns out that we have licensed the digital versions of those 19th century materials. And it, he has them uh, look at those media and, and get a feel for what the era was like. But he also wanted to have them explore primary resources. And we didn't have uh, very rich primary resources of the time period. But luckily, what is a, a growing phenomenon is that publishers are digitizing whole collections of primary resources. In this case, a publisher that has captured all of Queen Victoria's journals. Now the Queen started keeping her journal at age 13 and kept it throughout her whole lifetime. So we have from the Royal Library as well as the Baudelaire a partnership here to reproduce all of those handwritten diaries as well as the transcripts that her daughter kept and a whole range of associated material from those collections. So you see here, for example, one of the diary entries and she's talking about, and I know you can't read the handwriting there, but she's talking about what she's reading, which is Oliver Twist. She also talks about the various times of the day when she likes to read, including in the morning when uh, someone is helping uh, lace her into her garments. So it's, it's a very personal view of the era, but also through the eyes of Queen Victoria, how uh, Victorian era was unfolding, how the what the contemporary issues were in politics uh, and contemporary life. So this is a wonderful example of taking those primary resources and rather than having a researcher have to travel to the UK to see them, to be able to explore them online. It also represents a whole new economy in publishing, this kind of born again content that is not inexpensive. This particular product uh, is $16,000 and uh, to have access to uh, her journals. So what I've shared here is a sense of the dimensions of change, the diversity of formats, the new functionality that comes with uh, this kind of content and how it can be integrated into the workflow and also how the library becomes a contributor and of course the whole new economics of content where most of it is licensed as opposed to purchased. So let me shift to that other classic role of libraries. How do we provide access to content? Now the, the card catalog is long gone uh, and replaced by the website, which I think you can see here reflects a very different notion of how we look things up. Uh, very Google-like, you can search in that one single box and find not just books and what journals we have, but what article 
level information is available, uh, other media images. It's a, a very, very broad search that you can conduct and then refine. And it, it means that we, we bring to your fingertips uh, an extraordinary wealth of information. But we do more than that. And that is that we begin to think about how we take that role of providing access and share it with others on campus. So a number of years ago, we launched something called the Digital Conservancy, which is a place where individuals on campus can deposit their works to make them accessible globally, and we will preserve them over time, where a department can share its publications or reports or any other kinds of history of the department. Here you see a forestry uh, publication but also where the work of the university can be captured. So all the regents proceedings, the strategic planning reports, anything that would normally have been in the university archives can now be kept and preserved in the conservancy. That has begun to expand over time as well. And uh, you see here to the right uh, something called the data repository for the University of Minnesota, or DRUM as we call it. The federal government um, and its agencies are beginning to require that researchers who have grants uh, share their data that underlies their research. Now, obviously not when uh, something is a protected information, but, but how do we incentivize and, and enable interdisciplinary research by sharing data? So um, the data repository uh, helps us uh, make that data, those data accessible to preserve them over time, and we work with the individual researcher to structure and make those data useful to others. You see here uh, some of the features. It will also make their research more visible and will preserve it over time. But it also incentivizes and enables global research. Now here you see an example of something from the Center for Transportation Studies. These are data that relate to uh, transportation data and how close uh, someone is to transportation to get to their work uh, environment. And this particular uh, uh, data set was deposited last year uh, in 2014 and it's already been downloaded over 4,000 4, times. So enabling research in a global context. Now one last bit of, of how access is changing is the things that we can do with those primary resources, those unique and archival collections and how we can add value to them. So here you see an example of part of our university archives and the records that we have from the work of Dr. Walton Lillyhyde, someone who was involved at the very beginning of open heart surgery and all of the evolution of that process. Uh, and you can see here what the curator has done is in a way built an online exhibit about the archives of Lily High and all of the associated evolution of the programs at the university. Everything from the mechan early mechanical hearts to the cross-circulated heart, which was a process whereby another individual was next to the operating table and that individual's heart was helping circulate the blood for the patient. So you can browse through this much like a book, look at the chapters, but each of those sections is illustrated with the primary sources from the archive. And here you see some of the early models of the artificial heart. Um, there's other things in here about Earl Bakken and the early medical device industry. So a fabulous example of the interpretive aspect that we can now bring to the archives. So, I hope what I've illustrated is another way that our classic roles have, are changing, in this case around access, the whole notion of search, uh, paying attention to that scarcity of attention and how to help you filter and make more productive looking for things. That, that's really a sense-making capacity, helping provide context, interpretation, and provenance and telling, helping explain the, uh, how, the, uh, uh, how authoritative a source might be. So it's, it's a truly expanded role. Well, I want to shift lastly to talking about services and programs and how they've changed. And certainly all of our libraries uh, still have a service desk when you come in and you can ask your reference inquiry there, get help on the spot. 
from our trained staff. But you can also, any time, day or night, any of you can go online and there's a simple button that says Ask Us and you can get help. Now we don't stay up 7 by 24, but we can contract with libraries around the world who can help our users when we uh, are not uh, at work. <laughs> so it's a wonderful way to uh, harness the expertise around the globe to help our users. Now the library also has a broad range of instructional programs. You see here a little slide depicting some of our introductory coursework and, and seminars about conducting library research. We have those as regular classes, but we also have them as online tutorials to help students learn how to effectively use content, to narrow their topic, to think about how to document their research for a paper, how to evaluate content. And we have a range of other courses on copyright, on uh, how to manage your data, how to use tools, and so much more. And we also have really compelling evidence about the impact for the student. We've been working with the Office of Institutional Research to document the correlation between library use and student success as represented in GPA and also in retention. Will the student return? How likely is that? And what we have found is a very high correlation between library users and those uh, data about success. We've also documented that, that the overwhelming majority of our students do use the library, about 80%. But let me show you a, da a data point here that I think is really compelling. So this is looking at, on the bottom axis, ACT scores, so trying to look at a range of student readiness, if you will, or capacity, and then looking at library users represented in red and non-users in blue. So at almost every level of the ACT score, there is a, a bump in GPA associated with being a library user. And I've, I've reflected here a quote that I love, no one ever graduated from a library, but no one ever graduated without one. We are a fundamental partner in the learning process and so important to student success. Now there's many other ways that we are involved in the curriculum and an example here in experiential learning. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm assuming you, you can't read all that text but, but let me tell you the story here. So there's a course in aquaponics uh, working with six faculty who are teaching the course. They come from disciplines like horticulture and forestry and veterinary medicine and environmental disciplines. And what they do is have the students conduct a real research project, develop a hypothesis, and then collect the data, uh, do the background research, and also present it in the form of a poster. Now in the sciences, that's a very uh, common way of uh, early on uh, form of publication, of learning to present your work at a conference perhaps. So the library is helping design that curriculum, those experiential opportunities, helping the students learn to find the background uh, materials, but helping them publish it, helping them think about the crafting and the tools they need to create the poster. And then we're archiving them in the Digital Conservancy, so they will live on and be exemplars of that early work. Another area of education uh, is in the medical arena and the health sciences. Now the trends there have been towards something called evidence-based techniques where uh, students are learning how to find the evidence behind a clinical protocol or behind the efficacy of a drug or the contraindications of a drug. And our librarians uh, teach the students how to do that kind of evidence-based uh, techniques, but they also are involved in uh, actual real-time uh, walking through the evidence. So for example, the morning report is a weekly gathering of residents where they review cases and the librarian is there bringing up the evidence as the cases are presented. And you see in the image here patient rounds where the librarian, who's the one not in a white coat, who is similarly with his iPad is bringing up the evidence um, and you also see in the short coat the, the medical student who is real time experiencing um, how that technique works really integral to medical education. 
Another way that we're integrated uh, is in new scholarship. A number of years ago, we worked with Professor John Nichols, who had spent a lifetime amassing an Ojibwe dictionary, uh, researching all of the words uh, and, and documenting them. So what we have done is helped produce this. It is uh, a dictionary that certainly has text where you can read about the definitions of words, but you can also uh, see the images, which we brought in from the um, Minnesota Historical Society. And uh, we have 11 native speakers who uh, say the words, and you can listen to them and hear how they're pronounced. That's an early example of publishing, of helping distribute new content. And we've recently launched a formal publishing service. Uh, our early list of titles here, we have a number of journals, uh, many of which feel like a journal, look like a journal, but some of them are quite interactive. Uh, Smart Politics is actually something that existed earlier as a, as a blog-like publication, uh, has millions of users around the world, in particular uh, the media um, community. Uh, so another role of helping produce new content. And the last examples here are about how we take those primary sources and add value, but also develop services around them, not just for the campus, but for others. So our Minnesota Digital Library has worked with 180 different organizations in the state, libraries, uh, historical societies, um, museums, to digitize some of their primary source material and make them available, not only within the state, but through a national service called the Digital Public Library of America. And you see here an image from Excelsior, Minnesota, the Scrambler. Uh, many of you remember that wonderful ride. It probably still exists. Uh, but this was back when there was um, uh, an amusement park in Excelsior, uh, long gone. And the, the Digital Public Library of America takes those images and also helps create exhibitions around various themes. It has tools that allow you to explore by place or by date, so much more powerful than a physical archive could be. And in a similar vein, we're working with uh, other communities uh, in ways to capture their history. We've been working with the Immigration History Research Center on campus and their efforts to capture the histories of new immigrants, and in this case, uh, Vietnamese. You see here um, uh, something about this, this woman who uh, her family has uh, come to Minnesota in the 80s, and we've captured her story. And I'm going to show here just a very brief snippet from her oral history. So marvelous stories that we're able to capture and uh, make accessible. So that brings me to the, the closure here about services, that uh, the dimensions of change here are really that we are embedded in those workflows in, in teaching and learning and research. We support the full life cycle of uh, content from its uh, creation to its use. And then we now have an opportunity to engage not only our local campus and local state communities, but also global communities, anytime, anyplace. So I'm going to close here with a quote from uh, President Kaler's uh, State of the University address last year. Uh, his address this year uh, it will be happening soon. Uh, but he, he said to the audience in closing that what we do here every day truly matters. And I hope what I've conveyed to you is what the library does every day truly matters. He went on to say that what the university does is provide an ecosystem for uh, discovery and also a cradle for civilization and culture. And I hope you see that the library does that as well. We, we do that in classic ways that uh, I started with, building collections, making them accessible, and providing services. But digital has given us so much more power for impact. 
Thank you all for listening. Uh, I look forward to talking with all of you. Wendy, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And we have, um, if you'd like to learn any more about ways to stay connected to both the libraries and the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, please be sure to visit these sites listed here. Thank you.